Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar tonight from the Mental Health Professionals Network. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So Steve Trumbull is my name. I'm a GP by training. Uh, I'll be facilitating tonight's webinar. My current role is as Head of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne, so responsible for the medical course there. I'm also a presiding member at um, Medical Panels Victoria, so looking at um, work cover impairment assessments and things like that. But I'm delighted to be able to uh, facilitate tonight's panel. Um, we are partnered tonight with ComCare to produce this webinar, and you probably already know, but just to remind you that ComCare is a government regulator, workers' compensation insurer, claims manager and scheme administrator. Um, ComCare works with employees, employers, service providers and other stakeholders to minimise the impact of harm in the workplace, improve recovery and return to work and promote the health benefits of good work. And we'll be talking a bit about good work tonight. So I might just get the next slide to show us the panellist biographies. I won't go through those in detail because they were circulated. But uh, on the panel tonight, we have uh, Dr. D.L. Fellman who was one of my medical students back in the 90s. Hello, Deal. Unchanged. Now a psychiatrist, though, and a psychiatrist who specialises in um, rehabilitation or industrial uh, psychiatry, I guess. I'm sure you've got a better term for it than that. But I'm really curious, what do you find most rewarding about helping people who are struggling with issues at work as a psychiatrist? Oh, uh, nice to see you, Stephen. Occupational psychiatry is what I call it, even though there is... Um, no such specialty, um, there probably should be. I, I love working in this space because, I, I, as we know, people in this space are often very vulnerable and we know that their trajectory can go quite bad, badly and I really like to help them get on the right trajectory. I like to collaborate with other people, their treaters, the employer, the insurer. I like to leverage off the resources of the insurer and employer to help in their recovery as well. So Great. I love about it. Work is a very important part of the person, so obviously that's an important part of their uh, of their treatment as well. So fabulous. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Also to introduce Dr Stephen Kay, who's a GP here in Victoria as well. Now, Stephen, how can a general practitioner be successful in supporting someone experiencing workplace issues? What, what do you do that makes you most successful? Yeah, hi, Steve. Thanks, uh, thanks for that intro. Um, the... the the main thing that uh, really needs to be done is taking time and being curious with the patient uh, with their with their workplace issue, whether it whether it be physical or mental. Time to explore the workplace itself through the patient's eyes, their other influences, their domestic life, their education, their finances uh, in broad terms, of course, um, and then have the connection and the, the uh, relaxedness to engage with the workplace in order to, uh, to sort out with the patient the ideal outcome to provide a good work environment. Fabulous, Stephen. And back in the day when I was working at Monash and Deal was one of my students, um, John Murto, the, one of the doyens of uh, general practice, used to have a sign above his consulting room desk saying, be curious. And that really stuck with mm -hmm. me. If we lose the curiosity about the people we're working with, we lose the joy in our in our jobs, I reckon. So it's fabulous to hear you introduce that concept already. So thank you very much indeed. And also we're joined by Suzanne Gibson from north of the Murray, New South Wales, clinical <laughs> psychologist. So Suzanne, as a clinical psychologist, what are the main elements of um, success in supporting somebody who's experiencing workplace issues? I think what's unique about uh, working with someone who has those workplace issues that they're trying to overcome is the need really to collaborate with all of the stakeholders within the process, not just other treatment providers who are helping that person, but also the employer and the return to work professionals. Because I think what they bring to the table are those key pieces of information that uh, will help you to um, really inform your decision making, inform the advice that you're giving to the patient and the client and help you to develop that comprehensive plan that's going to um, give them the best chance of recovery. 
Well, fabulous, Suzanne. It's so good to hear you talk about teamwork because that's obviously underpinning everything that MHPN is about, that, uh, that network of professionals. And uh, looking at the chat room, I can see we've got people from social work, psychology, all sorts of different disciplines here. So that's absolutely fabulous. Uh, disability, mental health counsellors and uh, so on. Social work again. So fantastic. And uh, I'm glad that you see that, um, that team as being what it's all about. So, so uh, now the next slide, I think, will take us to the learning outcomes, uh, which are there. And what we want to do is look at uh, assessing functional capacity to work in people with psychological injuries. And we will hopefully give you tonight the skills and knowledge to uh, outline the benefits of participating in good work for patients who are experiencing health conditions that may impair their ability to work. We'll also look at assessing a patient's functional capacity for work. Uh, particularly based on their psychological health and well-being. Uh, we hope you'll be able to explain a person's current capacity to work and also to provide advice on suitable modifications to support a patient's continued participation, participation in their workplace. And finally, uh, how to establish early expectations for continued work participation and recovery, which is an issue that comes up all the time that I'm sure we will uh, address tonight. So I think the next slide now will take us to our first presentation, which is going to be from Dr. Stephen Kay, our GP, because very commonly a uh, patient like Lisa uh, will end up with her GP, as has happened. We won't go through the case here again, but just to remind you that it ends up that she feels completely overwhelmed when she goes along to see her GP, uh, seeking a medical certificate to have a week off, work to rest as she's finding it hard to cope, needs to get her thoughts in order. So Stephen, uh, Lisa's booked a 15 minute consultation with you. Here she is, over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Steve. Um, it, this case is uh, is somewhat typical and uh, you know, unfortunately the 15 minute consultation is the one that usually gets booked. Um, the GP uh, in, in their role around the country is uh, ideally placed to really take the central space uh, for management of these sort of cases. Um, there are, the accessibility of general practice around the country is uh, substantial, um, albeit that there is a workforce issue right at the moment, but um, we'd hope that GPs are still the number one port of call for most uh, working workers' compensation uh, injuries, um, be they mental or physical. And the GP role is really to do that, uh, that, that you know, in-depth assessment to, uh, to learn about the patient, to be curious, as we said before, um, which can often generate a very complex and challenging uh, consultation. Um, and clearly 15 minutes may not be enough time. So we need to be wary of, of uh, that time factor and that rush to, uh, to make that happen. Um, Certainly the understanding from uh, everybody's point of view, but in particular from the GP's point of view, is that work uh, is a very positive thing for health and not working is a very negative thing. And, and that brings us to the concept of the benefits of good work, health benefits of good work, and really has been shown multiple times, multiple studies worldwide, that working as appropriate with good work is a positive contributor uh, for people's general health and for their overall um, well-being. Um, um, next slide, please. So the, in this case study, study where we've got a, a distressed 43-year-old, so it's an adult, she's uh, in mid, mid of, midlife, you know, working, um, obviously you know, has a number of people who uh, um, she works with uh, in her team, um, so it's quite a responsible place. And uh, once the GP has assessed her and taken an in detail history um, and examination, really to identify if there's any physical uh, problems going on as well. So we really need to make sure, and I know this is a mental health case and we need to focus on that, but from a generalist point of view, we need to make sure that we're not missing any physical ailment going on. In specifically thyroid disease and calcium disease in this, uh, um, in this particular um, case. So uh, drug, drug uh, usage, um, substance abuse, um, other psychological past history, maybe not related to work or may be related to work, all needs to be explored um, before we can come to some sort of conclusion about where we're going in this, in this case. Uh, next slide, please. So once we've 
come to the conclusion that physically uh, Lisa is okay, that she uh, she's uh, um, suffering from a, a mental uh, illness rather than a physical illness. Um, we need to then engage uh, with her in that in that framework and continue to actively listen to what she says um, and to provide empathy and support so that we can be seen as a trusted uh, advocate for her um, through this journey that she's now commencing um, with her workplace um, on side rather than a combative environment with her workplace. Um, so from a mental health point of view, um, we want to make sure we want to try and assess her uh, ability to work um, and what uh, what level uh, she uh, she has, what capacity she has at the moment. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, so that we we're assessing her all the time and assessing her uh, current uh, abilities. The next slide, please. So then we once we have a level a feel for how she can work. Um, what her functional capacity is. We, with the, the basis of uh, the health benefits of good work, we, as a base, want to try and encourage her to stay at work and not to miss work, but nevertheless to uh, make work safe for her. So the, the benefits of good work, um, and there's many definitions for the health benefits of good work, um, so we want her workplace to be fair, respectful, to create a level of, of autonomy for her to uh, to work um, in an autonomous fashion, safely, and to and to have an idea of the the interests of herself as well as the workplace, as well as society at large, in order to create positive encouragement. So in this case, we need to remove the negatives of work, maintain her at work with those positives to to keep her buoyant and afloat. Uh, from a GP's point of view, we may well need to use uh, people like Suzanne and DL to help uh, with her psychological care um, to improve her outcomes. We may need to uh, commence medication to, again, to align her thinking. We may need to use other therapists as well. And we certainly, we're the best placed inevitably to do a certificate of capacity um, in order to communicate with the workplace via paper or digitally, um, but also uh, as, a, as a compulsory thing, but also with her permission to communicate verbally with the workplace and therefore develop a plan of attack with either the managers in the workplace or the return to work coordinator to, uh, to create a safe environment for her to work in. Next slide, please. Um, I won't, this is a very long slide and I won't go through it, just you can have a read, um, but really we're trying to assess her capacity to work and so we're trying to create, we're trying to understand that um, and then create an environment where she is within her capacity but nevertheless trying to keep her at work and that's that delicate balance that we need to come to in order to uh, um, to aid and, and uh, facilitate her recovery in order to get to back to full unimpeded work. Next slide, please. And we've got a, there's a number of resources that are around. This, this one is from uh, Concare's website um, as a snapshot and an idea uh, process to, uh, um, to follow those threads um, in order to, uh, uh, to give Lisa, in this case, the best the best possible opportunity to, uh, to recover and to uh, get back to normal work uh, unimpeded from any mental health and psychological illness. I think, I'll go back to you, Steve. I think okay, that's the last yeah. one I'm on. Yeah, thanks very much, Stephen. And just while, before we move on, I think a few people are having some trouble getting into the chat room. That might be resolved by now. There's 1,200 people online and uh, it seems to have just blocked things up a little bit. So apologies if you're not in the chat room as yet. Um, that should be opened up soon. So thanks very much, Stephen. I think um, uh, I have heard that there's a um, ComCare uh, guide at GP's, um, uh, uh, sorry, the ComCare guide that helps a GP assess a patient's capacity to work. And actually, as it turns out, I think that resource was developed by uh, part of it with D.L. Philman and the late Peter Cotton um, some years back. So uh, 
Uh, is that something that you think the average GP might find useful? Stephen, it is in our resource list if people wanted to, to grab that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, as you said, it's in the resource list being provided for tonight's, uh, tonight's webinar. And it certainly is. It gives a lot of structure. So often these consultations with people in this fashion are, are often have a heightened level of, of uh, distress from the patient and there's a chaos involved. There's a chaotic uh, world that's going on of, of, you know, just needing to run away and just get away from work because that's the source of the problem. So we as the clinician need to understand that, unpack that, and so we need structure to do that. So Comcare with the College of Physicians and DL have produced um, an assessing patients' capacity to work guide which gives that structure so that each of the components can be analysed and can be graded in order to uh, share with the patient some uh, line in order to keep her at work and get her to recover at the same time. Fabulous. All right, good to know. And again, under the little information icons where you'll find that resource, and it looks like the... Um, uh, the elves in the background have fixed the chat room and the people are now coming in. Looks like you've got speakers' rights, which will be interesting. Uh, there's about 870 people in there now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's going to be like the world's most chaotic cocktail party, which is fantastic. <laughs> so, look, thanks for that, Stephen. That's very helpful. Um, inevitably, I guess, or hopefully, you might work alongside a psychologist. So maybe we'll move on now to see what Suzanne Gibson has to say about the psychologist's uh, perspective. Um, Thank here you, we Steve. Are. Yeah, thanks. And actually, just before you start, Suzanne, mm -hmm. uh, the Common Care colleagues have posted a link to that GP uh, assessment guide in the chat box as well if people want to do that. But don't look at it while Suzanne's talking, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, so I just wanted to start off by touching on a topic that, that Stephen also spoke about, um, which is the health benefits of good work. So what really stood out to me when I read through the case study is that Lisa has a really strong desire to retreat from the workplace, to quit her job and, and to go away and hide under the duda, so to speak. Um, and considering the amount of stress that she's under, the symptoms that she's experiencing and the amount of time that she's been under stress, I think that's completely understandable um, and, and completely normal. And while an initial period of rest is likely to be helpful for her to just settle down some of those symptoms and to allow her to implement some self-care strategies, it is going to be really important for Lisa to be able to re-engage with the workplace as soon as possible. Um, and this idea is encapsulated within um, the consensus statement, which talks about the health benefits of good work, which, as you probably know, was developed by a faculty of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians in 2011. Um, and what they did in this statement is collate the evidence that demonstrates that returning to work not only helps us to maintain good health, it also helps us to recover when, when we're unwell. So I think from a, a psychologist perspective, you know, this isn't news, right? If, if we think about work as providing an opportunity for goal-oriented um, behaviour, then it, it really taps into those principles which underline some of the evidence-based treatment strategies that we know tend to be helpful to people to overcome any mood disturbances. So behavioural activation, for example, um, is very much aligned with going back to work and, and being engaged in activity. And for some people, for some of us, you know, engaged in pleasant activities. So it is likely that um, having that return to work process start will help Lisa to lift her mood by using those behavioural activation principles. You know, another treatment strategy which very closely aligns with the return to work process, although it's not so relevant for Lisa's case, is the um, treatment strategy of graduated exposure. So uh, when I'm working with people who are experiencing high levels of anxiety um, due to a workplace incident, it's really helpful to be able to use that return to work process in line with the graduated exposure process. Return to work provides lots of opportunities for exposure. Um, and so those two processes can really align nicely. Um, and the other thing that, that returning to work allows for is practising those skills that someone is learning within the treatment room. So I can imagine for Lisa, you know, um, 
learning maybe some self-care strategies, perhaps some assertive communication skills, maybe some problem-solving skills are all likely to be helpful for her with these challenges that she's facing. And so going back to work will allow her to practice those in real life, so to speak, and, you know, that's likely to allow her to consolidate her learning and, and really put those skills in place. Um, and I think whenever we're working with someone who is um, attempting a return to work or facing workplace challenges, if we can focus on really trying to upskill them and equip them to be able to go back into the workplace, that's going to be really helpful. We, um, of course, need to ensure that that workplace they're returning to provides good work. But if we are able to give them those skills to face those challenges that they might face at work, it's not only going to be helpful for them now in their current situation, but also for any future challenges that might come their way. I could add the next slide, please. So in terms of when you're thinking about how you might provide advice around um, someone's functional capacity, you know, I was thinking about this from um, what I do with, with my clients and really there's a lot of information that we're gathering just as part of our normal assessment and treatment process that tells us what someone is capable of doing. So if you think about, you know, the type of information you're thinking about in the mental status exam, in the symptoms that someone might be reporting, in what they're telling you about what they're doing from day to day, any assessments you might have done, um, and also what they've been capable of in the past. You know, with Lisa, she was managing a team of 30 people. It takes quite a lot of skill and ability to be able to do that. So the fact that she was able to do that in the past really informs what she might be able to be capable of going back to in the future. Um, and I just wanted to mention this last one, which is a functional capacity evaluation. So this is a semi-structured assessment, which is usually completed by a workplace rehab provider, and it can provide you with really detailed information about what someone's functional capacity might be from a psychological perspective. So it can be really helpful. Thank so you. One I'm sorry, I'm still going. <laughs> so once you have that information, then it's about really matching that with, with the demands of the job to translate it into workplace um, function. Can I have the next slide, please? So here I've just really provided some examples of how you might translate symptoms that you're seeing in the treatment room into those work-related functional limitations. It's really just about taking them from um, the treatment room into that work context. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, but, you know, just provides you with some examples of, of how you might go about that. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and so, you know, the other piece of information that can be really helpful in informing you about what um, the client that you're working with might be required to do um, at the workplace and how they're going to be capable of doing that is information about the types of demands that are required within the job. So this is just an example list of questions that, again, would be asked by a workplace rehab provider when they're doing a workplace assessment to determine exactly what is required of someone from a psychological perspective. So if you're able to get this information, the answers to these questions, then that allows you, again, to do that real match between what you're seeing, what has been, is being reported to you, and what is needed within the workplace so that you can provide a really detailed um, explanation of, of what someone is capable of doing or not. Now the next slide, please. And then to finish off, I really just wanted to mention the idea of graduation, which I think is really key to success when you're working with someone who is attempting to go back to work. Um, and, you know, this is um, a, a principle that we use generally within the treatment process but it very much aligns with the return to work process. Most return to work processes are graduated in nature. And so starting with what the client is currently capable of doing, helping them to figure out their end goal that they want to get to, and then developing the steps that take them along that process towards that end goal um, is going to very much match what is happening for them within the return to work. And so your treatment's going to align with that return to work process. And it gives that person the sense of consistency and, and you know, a, a pathway towards their recovery. So that's it from me. You sure? No, fabulous. Thank you very sure much. Sure, this time. <laughs> Absolutely. Hold on. Thank you.
Um, now we'll go to the psychiatric perspective. So, uh, DL, over to you. So um, first, Stephen and Susan Hardax to follow, and I'd love to collaborate and work together on some patients with <laughs> help them get better with you guys. Um, I actually wanted a couple hours to do my bit, and I was told I could have about six to eight minutes, so um, five minutes. So um, I was trying to think how I can fit it into five minutes, and I remembered that a picture tells or a picture's worth a thousand words. So I thought I'd start with a couple of pictures. So this one's really to illustrate that I'm really quite worried about Lisa. Like I think that she, I feel like she's about to explode. She has so much going on, doesn't she? I mean, she's had work pressures for a couple of years and quite significant work pressures dealing with um, clients who have faced significant stresses like the floods, the fires, COVID and having to support a massive team of 30. She's lost her boundaries between work and home. She's not being the best manager that she wants to be and I think she's quite perfectionistic and that would be hard on her. She's got some relationship issues. There's some resentment building to her partner who's not really pulling his weight. She's not being the best mum that she wants to be to her kids, getting quite snappy. And she's starting to worry about her physical health too, worried about her heartbeat. So I think it's coming at her from all angles and I'm not surprised with Suzanne said that she wants to just you know hide on hide under the covers um next slide please I kind of feel that Lisa's at a bit of a crossroads and I'm a little bit worried for her she's already taken a couple of days off work and she's asking for another five which which is a bit of time and I, I don't know if if being off work for her is going to be used for good and she's going to, you know, work out how she can change things at work and how she can better upskill herself and prepare herself for the challenges ahead or whether she is going to just jump under that doona cover and spend all her time stressing, ruminating, uh, worrying, maybe starting to drink some alcohol, disengage, lose confidence. So I really think it, it, it's, it's a hard place she's in at the moment and as the person deciding to do a certificate, we've got a lot to think about and we'll come to that. Um, next slide, please. So I, I guess I should share some psychiatry. So I think some of the things as a, as a psychiatrist I'd be thinking about right now is the stresses. So we've talked about some of these, the build-up over a long time, the challenges uh, with her role itself, the responsibility. She's lost that boundary, that 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 safety of home, being uh, away from work with, you know, work going into her personal life. Uh, she's got some protective factors too, doesn't she? Though she's uh, quite, she's help seeking. She's going to see Stephen. Um, she has no prior history of mental health difficulties. We don't know of any maladaptive coping mechanisms, and she works for a large government organisation, which makes me think they'll be able to support her with some modifications more easily than maybe a, a smaller employer. employer although they should be able to support her as well. Um, so I think about her symptoms. She's got a whole range of symptoms, rumination, preoccupation. She's distressed. She's tired. She's not sleeping. She's ruminating. She's got a lack of motivation. She's got physical symptoms of anxiety. Um, objectively, she doesn't. She looks tired. Her self-care is maybe a bit reduced. She's anxious. Um, things I'm thinking about, first of all, as, as Stephen pointed out, is... is um, making sure there's no organic contributors like thyroid function. Hopefully someone's done that before they see me already. And also reassuring her about her heart. She's worried about her palpitations and I want to remove that as something else to worry about. I also want to make sure she's not self-medicating with alcohol or drinking excessive caffeine to get through her day because that will increase anxiety too. Um, then I'd be thinking about diagnosis and, uh, you know, I don't necessarily need to diagnose her at this early stage, but in the back of my mind, I'd be wondering, is, you know, is this a normal reaction? Is there no diagnosis? Does she have an adjustment disorder? Are we seeing an emergent depression or anxiety? I'd want to think about trauma symptoms because I think they can be missed a lot of the time if we don't ask. And obviously she's had to deal with a lot of distressing customers and staff in distress. So maybe there's a bit of trauma there and thinking about her personality style and the impact on how she's presenting now. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd put a slide in about certification and, and do we certify or not and what we need to think about. And I think it is something that takes a lot of thought because I think, um, you know, prolonged certification can be a significant problem. So I think the first question we need to think about is what type of certificate, just a general medical certificate or a work compensation certificate in this setting? I'm not sure what you would think. 
how long are we going to certify her off for? So personally, I think a week on top of the two days she's already had is getting up there for a bit long. And ideally, I'd be doing a couple of days and asking her to come back. Although I know as a psychiatrist, it's not always so feasible. And maybe in GP land, it's, it's, it's difficult too. But I think it's really important at the time of the first certification to set expectations of how long you think that person should have off because I think setting goals the research shows results in um, someone more likely to return to work within a time, time frame but certainly from the outset less is more I think. I think we need to think with Lisa about the purpose of the certification, the time off work. So is it so she can lie in her bed and under her covers and just avoid and hide from the world or is it so that she can use that time purposefully to look after herself, to re-engage with exercise, to re-engage with friends, to maybe see Suzanne um, and, and learn some strategies and also for her or her advocate or her GP or psychologist to um, speak to the workplace and work out how her role can be adjusted so that when she does return, it's to safe work. I think it's really important to talk about the benefits and the disadvantages or the risks of certification. I think we all know that, you know, when you're anxious, the the worst thing to do is to avoid something in general. When you fall off your bike, the first thing we say is get straight back on. So I think we need to think about the risks of suggesting someone stay away from work if they are anxious and let them know that um, it's not recommended long term and we should be getting back with supports. Next slide, please. So just in terms of what I think about specifically in Lisa's case, in terms of how do I evaluate her, her work capacity, well, just in a basic nutshell, for me, work capacity to, to be able to be fit for work means she needs to be able to attend regularly and reliably, perform at the expected standard, abide by a code of conduct and work not be an occupational health and safety risk. And I think at, at this stage, you know, work unchanged would be a little bit of a risk for her. I then think about the job demands, what's been done so far, what, what, what is there anything she's done to, to work out a way to manage better at work, her view on how things can be changed. I'd love to get some feedback from her employer about the supports that are available. I'm then going to do a detailed functional assessment and have a look at her functioning, and I know you've got a resource on that, and then marry her functioning up with some potential temporary modifications. And I won't go through all of these now, but, for example, she's fatigued. It gets better as the day goes on, so maybe we need to think about shorter days and a later start time. She's not concentrating so well, so maybe we need to think about lower expectations, reduced KPIs, reduced outputs, not as much multitasking. She's feeling snappy, irritable. She's got less to give. And so maybe we think about giving her some more autonomy and um, limit some direct reports. She's unable to switch off. So maybe for her, if she is still working from home, returning to the office and resetting some of those boundaries would be useful. And lastly, I think we need to have a look at her role as well and make sure it is good work and that it is one full-time equivalent and not more, because I wonder if she's doing a lot more than that. Next slide, please. So in terms of just my general overview of a way forward for Lisa, it's about making time. We've talked about this, listening and evaluating, providing validation and psychoeducation, as Suzanne suggested, make sure there's no organic factors, as Stephen's gone through, reduce any harmful coping mechanisms and put back into her life some, some helpful coping mechanisms. Consider treatment, psychological therapy probably first up, and then we might look to see whether there might be a role for medication. Be thoughtful about your certification and review regularly, especially once she goes back to work. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Deal, and thank you to all of you for being so concise in what you've talked about. There's actually a huge amount of um, interest in the uh, questions in the chat chat room that people are asking about. I've been desperately trying to pull things together. Um, there's an unfeasible number of Jeremy's in the chat room. I'm not sure what a collective noun of Jeremy's is. Is it a, a Clarkson? That's a horrible thought. Maybe it's a Renner. Anyway, the Jeremy's were asking quite a lot about the workplace. But putting it all together, I'm wondering what we can do if, as a practitioner, we're lacking information about um the workplace itself, uh, we, often, we often don't know a lot about the workplace, including what the patient's work role is, what's actually involved in it, what suitable duties might be available to them if they can't do their, uh, their usual work, um, and what modifications may be practical in that particular case. How can they get more information? Stephen, is that something that you can pick from general practice? How do you go about finding out those things about the workplace? I guess the first thing to say is that 
you, you don't believe the patient can 100%. So the patient will often say, there's nothing that I can do. There's no job that I can possibly do in the workplace um, that will be safe for me, as Deal explained. To have that safe workplace is very important. And the patient initially will say, I want the week off, as Lisa has said, that she wants the week off because she feels that there's nowhere that's safe for her to go back to the workplace. So, again, with her permission, speaking to her manager, going up the tree and finding out what the workplace is actually like from a from an independent person, um, albeit involved, um, or getting a, an occupational health and safety officer to be involved, a return to work coordinator person to be involved and in, to um, tease out the, the needs of the job uh, as well as the current tasks that are being done and trying to match them up so that she's not overwhelmed, um, especially with you know in a in a uh, reduced capacity as she is at the moment. So it's it's often community. It's all related to communication, and uh, and you know open and frank discussion about the workplace itself, and coming to a to a um, to a, a consensus between interested parties to create an environment that's safe and productive for Lisa. Thanks, Stephen and Deal. You've seen it from both sides, I guess. What do you do in terms of finding out more about the workplace? Yeah, I agree with what Stephen says. I think it's important to obviously get consent from um, your patient first and then decide, is it going to be a verbal discussion with someone from the workplace? Are you going to ask for written information? I think verbal's best. And if it's verbal, are you going to have your patient present with you? Um, and are you going to share information as well as receive information? And I think, you know, it might be the manager, it might be someone from HR, it might be someone from people support, depending on the, on the size of the organisation. So finding out who that person will be and going to the right person is is ideal. I think as well as getting information about what the actual demands of the role are, it's really important to understand what the workplace can and what they can't accommodate because we don't want to be writing on the medical certificate restrictions that are just not going to be followed through with and our, our patient ends up sitting at home for longer how long the supports can be provided. And also sometimes the workplace will have other supports, even if there's not a, a claim, like, re, you know, access to rehab providers and things like that. So I think it's really important to find out all of that. And if there are other concerns, like there's performance management, which we know there, there are as well at times, then getting that information as well, what the particular concerns about performance, attendance, et cetera, are. So we have everything in front of us to, to work with. Thanks, Dio. Now on those lines, a few people have been asking about whether we're expecting too much of the person and not as much of the workplace and what really is the workplace's responsibility uh, to um, make changes and to support um, the worker in their return to work. Um, somebody's made the comment that sometimes they're given work that would sort of kill anybody brain dead and that can actually be a negative thing if they go back to a role which might reduce their self-esteem. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? And uh, Stephen, I suspect you probably think as a GP or that uh, a lot of GPs would feel as a temptation just to put the person off work rather than try that's, to... That's certainly the course of least resistance. It's just to, she'll be happy because you've given her what she wants, which is a week off work. Um, and then the next week she'll come in and nothing will have changed because nothing's changed. Um, so nobody else has been involved. The workplace hasn't been involved. Um, and so the, the demand then will be to, again, take the course of least resistance and have another week off or another two weeks off. And that, that cycle gets perpetuated and we end up with, with, a, with a single patient who started off as a very, as Suzanne said, a very capable manager of 30, you know, very busy job who's popped and suddenly hasn't been at work for multiple weeks or months, is out of the work stream, can, you know, has been taken, you know, is just not able to do her work anymore because she's been out for so long. And that the outcomes of that is uh, always negative. It's never a positive. And the data supports that, the data that's been, you know, generated around the world that with long periods of being off work altogether have a very negative impact on the person's social uh, health and workplace environment. Uh, so that's certainly not the not the way to go. But it takes time and effort to to intrude in the other way to actually get inside this whole problem and to to try and repair it uh, effectively. 
Can I add something to that as well? Yeah, please, Suzanne. Um, so, you know, I think, um, first of all, you, whoever asked that question, you're absolutely right. The workplace does have a responsibility to ensure that they are firstly providing duties of, of some sort for someone to return to work. And there are some requirements um, in some areas around providing meaningful duties as well. I think, though, in terms of the work that you're doing with your client or your patient, really thinking about that graduation process can be helpful in, in this instance. You know, it might be that the duties that someone is returning to initially aren't the most meaningful duties that they would ideally like to be doing, but there are likely to be benefits, as, as Stephen was saying, around just getting back into the workplace, getting back into a routine, staying connected with their colleagues. And so really trying to coach your um, client or patient around that of like, yeah, I, you know, I understand that right now this probably isn't the most um, exciting duties for you to be doing. The idea is that we're going to gradually help you to get back to that job that, that was meaningful for you. So trying to reinforce that idea with them I think can be helpful. Great, right, Susanna. While you've got the conch and before we go to DL, did you want to just speak a little bit more about some strategies uh, for overcoming the reluctance of people to, to go back to the workplace? What, what are some other things you might do apart from those words you used just then? Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we're working with reluctant people in, in any context, it can be really difficult. Um, I think the first step is really to, um, you know, start from us. Um, so, when I have someone who's really reluctant to engage in any process, including um, engaging in the return to work process, I really try and remind myself of why it is that this is going to be helpful. What is the evidence that I'm aware of that this is actually going to facilitate their recovery? So I think firstly, returning to what it is that we know about why this is good for the person it can be a really helpful place to start. In terms then of, of working with the person, you know, what, what I tend to see is that when people are reluctant, it's often because they have some concern about how psychologically safe they're going to be when, they're, when they return to work. And both DL and Stephen have spoken about ensuring that the workplace is a safe workplace to return to. So I think the first step is really ensuring that it is going to be safe. Um, and that's, that needs to be done in collaboration with the other parties. The return to work professionals and the employer have much more information about the workplace than we do. And so making sure that you're working with them to ensure that safety is going to be a really important first step. I think the other thing that's really key when working with someone who's reluctant is making sure that there's a very clear and structured plan in place for how they're going to approach that return to work process. So, you know, we all know working with people who are struggling with mental ill health, they tend to have um, issues with concentration and focus and memory and those sorts of things. And so um, making sure that there's a detailed and structured plan about when they return to work how long they're going to be um, working for each day, what sort of duties they're doing, what support mechanisms in place, what strategies they can use if they notice their symptoms are flaring. All of that is going to be really important for reassuring the person that there's going to be clarity around what they're doing when they go back. Um, also, what I find, and I, to be honest, I don't know if there's evidence around this, but what I find is that you know, when I'm working with someone who has a compensation claim, they can often feel like, the power to make the decisions over their life have been taken away from them to a certain degree. So making sure that you're involving them in the process um, is going to be really key to helping them to get some ownership over it, you know, having them set their own goals and, and even having them plan out the steps that they can take towards that goal could be, uh, can be really important. Um, and, you know, I, th I also think then um, taking them back to their values and how work connects with their values is, is another way to really tap into their motivation. So work aligns with um, our values for most of us in, in certain ways. It might be that work allows us to have a sense of achievement or it allows us the opportunity to make a positive impact, connects us with other people, or, or it even just allows us to provide for our families. Um, and so reminding um, that person that you're working with of how uh, work connects with their values and aligns with their values can help them to be reminded of, of why it might be important for them to go back to work. Thanks, Suzanne. Fantastic. Very comprehensive. Um, DL, do you have anything to add to what we've been yeah. talking about? 
Well, yeah, not much because I think Sudan set up it almost all. I think that with dealing with reluctance, for me, the most important thing is understanding that reluctance and trying to address it. So in Lisa's case, if it is that invocational goal of work coming back to this untenable job, then it's going to be about addressing that invocational goal as well and making sure the job is safe. Um, I agree wholeheartedly about working together. I think uh, my patients do, who are, are reluctant to go back, I think it works best when I get their buy-in for the return to work plan. So I'll say to them, how many hours do you reckon you can do in the first week? And I'll usually run with it. If it's three hours twice a week or four hours twice a week, that's fine. If they say one hour, then maybe I'll try and build on that. But I think letting them, empowering them to feel they're in control is really useful. And the other thing I do is often call it a trial. Their work capacity is untested. We're going to call this a trial so that they can feel safe, that we can stop it at any time. And also if they are on some insurance benefits or compensation, it's not just going to stop immediately. We're going to test it for a little while because I think there can be a bit of anxiety about losing that safety net too. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Stephen, anything from you? Any thoughts? Look, I've really just to, to highlight that the, a return to work needs to absolutely be safe and absolutely be meaningful if possible. Um, you know, it's and that's the that's most definitely what needs to happen. So we're engaging the patient and getting that getting that buy in from the patient as well as the workplace. So engaging the workplace and getting them to uh, encourage and embrace the patient to come back to work in a safe way um, is absolutely crucial. Um, having that drip feed of tasks um, and duties to try and get them back, but always in a safe way. And that does take time. There's a, there's a time component for, for all three of our specialties that needs to be encouraged to, uh, to be spent with the patient and with the workplace, maybe in a case conference, maybe by phone. There's all sorts of different methods to create an environment where, first of all, the, the, uh, the, the issue is identified by everybody and respected and then a plan is put in place to return the person to work. Can I just add as well, just I think it's quite important to note, like, and also going back to work is a time to up treatment, not reduce it. The number of people who I see who are back at work and so they've stopped seeing their psychologist, it's like, no, see them more regularly to identify and address issues as they arise rather than, you know, not have an appointment for a couple of months and come back and it's all fallen in a heap. Very important deal. And same with medication, of course. Uh, we had a webinar last week on postnatal depression and the idea of somebody stopping medication is when they need it most was hugely important. So I guess work is the same thing. Although there has been quite a bit of discussion on the side about people who might be re-traumatised by going back into their workplace and whether it ever gets to the point where they do have to actually change their employer. Does anybody have any thoughts about um, how we approach that if, say, in Lisa's situation, she's not there yet, but if it gets to the point where she has to change, how do we support people through that? Sometimes it happens. Some, yep. uh, sorry, Suzanne, I'll let you go. And say, but sometimes it happens where the, the workplace is just no longer appropriate for that particular person. And, you know, is, is it? can we facilitate a change of career, a change of job, um, location or whatever is necessary, then sure, if that's what is needed to happen in order to get the person in a safe workplace, then that's fine. That's not easy, but that's the, if that has to happen, then that has to happen. It's, uh, that, that's, that's the rules. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Stephen. I think, you know, there are some circumstances where um, it, it's just not going to be possible to get the person back to their old workplace. Um, I, I, you know, I, I can't remember where the stats come from, Lou, but, but there is some stat around um, it being much more difficult to find a new job than it is to return to your old job. So I think, you know, in any time when we're considering the change of workplace, it needs to be after it, a return to the same employer has been absolutely exhausted. We really need to know that we've tried everything that we possibly can to accommodate what um, that person is capable of doing in returning to their old workplace before we then move on to, to a new workplace. I have to agree with that. I always say don't make long-term decisions on potentially temporary emotions. And sometimes you need to call it early, but sometimes calling it too early can backfire for your patient as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. I'm just wondering, actually, I'm asking on behalf of Alison, Stephen, what item number do you charge when ringing an employer for to discuss these things? A uh, little bit depends if the patient's with us or not. 
Well, I'm if being a bit the, facetious here because I guess my point is there really is no payment, is there? No, and, there, well, they, there are, no, there, there are telehealth, uh, sorry, there are telephone call payments in some systems, so it depends on which jurisdiction you're working under and which, which, uh, which region. Um, so some do have telephone uh, compensation item numbers or, you know, item numbers appropriate for telephone calls. Um, with the patient, it's really an extended consultation at the end of the day, perhaps additional telephone call, and then there's case conferencing has its own item numbers as well. Um, so there, there are ways. Of workers' compensation generally is more is more generous than, than standard Medicare and the standard MBS. Um, yep. And certainly uh, has within it the identification of communication as a, a central core uh, reason for, um, for for its function and improving the outcomes. Great. Can I just add as well that some of the employers will fund, um, a, you know, a 15-minute appointment with you as well, if you ask. All right. That sounds entirely reasonable. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Another thing that's emerged is about, I guess the interface between our clinical system and the legal system and the sense from some of our participants that the two systems are not always pulling in the same direction and seem to be pulling in the same direction and that sometimes it appears that what we're trying to do clinically is not aligned with what the worker's trying to achieve legally. Are there any thoughts about that, about what we do as clinicians when we feel that the worker is either consciously or unconsciously being led into an illness behaviour that doesn't involve return to work, if I put that discreetly enough. <laughs> Who's up first on this one? Suzanne, you've got the green uh, ring. Of I'll have it both. Yeah. Like, um, so, I mean, I think we've all had that experience where we um, perhaps are seeing some behaviour that, you know, doesn't align with what we would think, um, you know, would normally going, be going on for someone who's um, experiencing the symptoms that our patient might be reporting. Um, and I, I guess, um, you know, my approach in that situation is really just to continue focusing on helping that person to get better. I think when you're working within a compensation scheme, it can be quite easy to become um, hypervigilant, I guess, to, to those sorts of things going on. Um, and um, it's it's not necessarily helpful, I guess, to go in with a high level of suspicion with, with clients in, in trying to work with them and facilitate the recovery. I think the other thing that, um, you know, we can keep in mind is that there are systems in place and processes in place which are designed to make it difficult for people to, um, you know, do anything illegal or to malinger, all those sorts of things. And they are often managed by the governing body or, or by the insurance company. And so I guess what that I feel that that allows me to do is to go into the mind, go in with the mindset of I'm just going to do, uh, be here to do my job to try and help this person get better based on the assumption that they are telling me the truth about what's going on and let the insurance company or, or the compensation scheme do the job that, that they are um, built to do. Sure. Yeah, all right. And uh, I'm not implying that the that the client would be doing these things deliberately, but it just seems that sometimes the systems are set up in a way that it tilts people against what we're trying to achieve, whereas it's hopefully everybody pulling in the same direction. Yeah. Any yeah, other? The, 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 runaway, the runaway factor that Lisa is exhibiting is give me a week off, which will turn mm. into multiple weeks, is, is no doubt is a negative. It's the... The data around the world is very strong. The longer people stay off work altogether, the least, the less likely they are to restart in their workplace, um, and and in fact potentially restart in any workplace. So they can be long term unemployed you know, or unemployable um, because of their time off work. So we know that, and we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. And exactly as Suzanne says, take that high road, take that. Um, that clinical outcome optimism to continue advocating and batting for the patient to try and get them back um, into a frame that uh, that encourages them to get back into the workplace um, in in some form or another. All right, great. Thanks. Can I add, can, have I got time to add something? Yeah, sure, deal. Yeah, I think it's getting a little bit better. I think a few years ago when there used to be a lot of surveillance done, the lawyers used to say, go to your room, shut, shut all the blinds, don't open, don't leave the house for six months, and what do you get at, at the end? Of the very sick, incapacitated, agoraphobic um, patients. So now that, now that there's 
not really much surveillance. I think that's getting a bit better. But I think it's important to have the open conversation if they do have a lawyer involved, you know, make sure your lawyer's, you know, not advising you things that are going to get in the way of your recovery um, and talk through that. And the other thing I think is, you know, if you think they've got capacity for work, then I think it's okay to say to them, I, I can't fill in a certificate for you. I know it can be hard, but, you know, I think you've got a partial capacity or I think doing something is going to be better for you, for you than, than where you are at the moment. How do you set things up, Deal, though, that you can have that conversation? What are the elements that you have to establish before you can be so patient-centred but outcomes-focused? Yeah, I, it's a very good question. I think it's all the things that we've talked about already. It's making time, um, being interested in your patient, understanding them, developing trust and rapport, and it's certainly not something you'd, you'd pull out the first, second or third session. It would happen over a, a period of time where hopefully you do have that, that therapeutic relationship and you know, you you got to say what you think's going to help your your patient, not not injure them. And I think if you say it in a way that you know is showing your best intentions for them and their outcome, then it can it can be taken okay. Sure. Okay. Look, I'm going to do something terrible here and ignore the questions and ask one of my own, which I'm generally curious about. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that the the incentive for a worker to participate. Like even though they might not be able to leave the house to go to work, they can go to their daughter's wedding. And I've heard that sort of held up as evidence that the worker has more capacity because they're able, they were able to attend their daughter's wedding. But I would have thought the, the drive to do that is going to unleash levels of ability that they might not be able to unleash to turn up to work every day. Is that fair? Do we need to obviously suspend judgment on people when they are able to do things because they really, really want to do them? Yes is the answer, is it? Okay, good. I'll move on to questions <laughs> no. that other people want to know. I think it's a really good question. Yeah, Suzanne, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a really tricky situation because being able to engage in those things is likely to help them to recover. Um, and so I have worked with some people who are very reluctant to engage in some of the strategies I'm recommending to help them improve their mental health because it might be seen by the insurance company as, as um, you know, hinting at some capacity that they don't feel that they have. Um, I, I wonder, though, in, you know, that example that you gave, whether um, a reduced capacity is, is perhaps appropriate in terms of, sure, they might not be able to go back for 40 hours, but um, if they are able to go out to a social event, would it be possible for them perhaps to, you know, perform reduced hours per week or something like that? And that's perhaps the way of, of um, working with that kind of situation. Sure, look, that makes so much sense. I'm, I'm interested. Um, I, look, I know we've touched on it a few times, but I'm not sure that we've really nailed one of the common questions that's come through a lot tonight, which is about resources that can help us to assess functional capacity for work. Uh, you've touched on them in your presentations, but just more or less as a summary, what would you see as the most useful resources for objectively assessing functional capacity for work? Who's up on that one? Is that you, Suzanne, or DL? Or Stephen? I've got no idea, so I'm throwing <laughs> it over to you. Um, What's your favourite? Definitely not my favourite, but there is a little five-minute video on the Compare um, website, I think, of me doing a functional capacity assessment, and uh, it's more of it for someone who's off work than at work at the time, but it's a, it's a starting point. Yeah. I think the lack of all of us jumping to answer the question identifies that it's a really tricky issue and, uh, you know, getting that right is is complex and uh, multifaceted. Mm -hmm. you really, really, it's the engagement is uh, is certainly a key feature in that, the trust and the, and the clinical relationship that you develop with the patients and then uh, having a, a framework and a structure to, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, in, to, um, to identify what they're capable of and perhaps incorporating the, the return, a return to work coordinator who's, who will uh, further unpack that and, and uh, identify lots of different features that the person is able to do rather than focusing on the negative and what they're not able to do, focusing on the positive, what they are able to do um, within the workplace itself. Okay, great. Thank you for that. I must say on the physical side of it, it often seems quite straightforward. You know, you limit the number of kilograms, no bending, no lifting, no squatting and things like that. The psychological aspects seem a little bit harder to put 
boundaries around. But uh, I guess that's what really needs to be made very clear to people. I'm often intrigued that sometimes the return to work coordinators seem to be suggesting that people become um, children's crossing supervisors. It seems to be the, the default job. I can't think of a worse place for somebody with mental health issues than trying to supervise children crossing a road. In traffic. Or playing soccer. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> it just seems like a really, really lousy place to be, but it seems to be on the list of that and car park attendance. But anyway. Um, Thinking about other questions, we're, we've only got a few minutes left before we get into the uh, sort of the summary part of it. Um, there are still questions, I guess, about potential bullying in the workplace. This case did not, well, it did raise flags, I guess, about the potential for some bullying or at least negative interpersonal interactions. Is this something that we need to get involved with as clinicians? I mean, obviously, that would contribute to an unsafe workplace. Does anybody have any thoughts about that particularly? Suzanne, looks like you're highlighted again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that can be quite common that you see people who have experienced some bullying in the workplace. And in terms of facilitating their initial return to work, it's often necessary to ensure that they don't have um, especially frequent contact with the person who's been involved in that. Um, and, you know, that's going to be absolutely necessary in, in ensuring that the workplace is safe. I guess, though, you know, um, none of us can control the people that we work with and none of us can control um, who we interact with in the long run. And so ideally, and I completely acknowledge this is not always possible, but if that person is able to learn how to deal with someone like that and, and how to manage that interpersonal interaction and, and um, you know, be able to face them, then, then that is going to be helpful for them in the long run. But, you know, I really want to add a caveat that I do understand that that's not always possible. Sure. No, I certainly agree with that. And actually, just on uh, an earlier point as well, there's a, a few people, um, Lee and uh, Tien and particularly, and several other OTs who have reminded me that uh, OTs can be very good at doing functional capacities, both physical and psychological, and yeah. that they should be part of our network so that we do get that expert input um, to uh, return to work. Absolutely. I think bullying is bullying, uh, a really big issue. Um, yeah. You know, within the interpersonal relationship disasters that sometimes happen at work, um, you know, can you get a, a group session? Can you get some sort of mediation to happen? Um, you know, it needs to be identified, called out, workplace involvement, um, and then some sort of mediation, which can often be very difficult to, to generate. The, the bully often is not interested. They haven't done anything wrong. They don't see it as an issue. Um you know, seen as a witch hunt sometimes, you know, all of these other issues come in. So uh, it's certainly very, very complex and uh, and very difficult um, to, to do that, to resolve those things. Sure. No, I think there's no question about that. Let's now finish up because we're in the last 10 minutes or so. So I just wanted to go around the three of you and get your final reflections, I guess, on Lisa's case and other things that we've talked about um, tonight. Um Suzanne, maybe we'd go to you first of all, and mm -hmm. then um, Stephen and then Deal. What are your final thoughts about what we've discussed tonight? Well, um, there are three key points that I hope people walk away from tonight's webinar with. And the first one, which, you know, we, we've all reinforced quite a lot, you're probably sick of hearing about it, but it's really about that um, principle of staying active and staying engaged with the workplace um, as soon as possible after someone experiences a psychological injury and, and you know, the evidence base that really supports that as, as a recovery strategy. Um, the other, other key point is around that idea of collaboration, of, of uh, drawing upon the expertise of the other people involved in that return to work process in order to provide a really detailed and, and well-informed plan for helping that person to recover that you're working with. Um, and then the third one is around graduation. So uh, taking that idea of this is where we are, this is where we're going to get to, uh, where you want to get to, and, and what are those steps in between to help you to get there, which, as I mentioned, really aligns with the return to work process. Right. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Stephen, I guess your final thoughts about, about the case and what we've discussed tonight? Yeah. Look, I think this is a, a really, you know, 
a, a true to life case. I don't think it's it's hypothetical at all. I think we're all seeing patients in this sort of space. She seems like a legitimate person who's got a legitimate job of quality and you know she's she's met some rough seas to passage through and you know I think our role is uh, um, is really to uh, to encourage and support her through that to navigate her way you know through these these difficult times um, using all of the skills that we have and whether that's you know using a team approach using medication using uh, you know, some structured structured format within the workplace to uh, to help her through all of this, and it's probably all of those, to be honest, um, to make it to make it actually happen. Um, uh, you know, having the team involved, having that that coordination and communication is uh, is what the GP in this particular case, or probably in most cases, to be honest, is the central. Uh, central player to coordinate everybody else around. So having those. Um, you know, communication channels wide open to, to have discussions and it takes time. There's a time process that needs to be reserved aside to provide that service to, to help this person. Um, it needs to be paid time. No one's doing anything for free but needs to be uh, appropriately remunerated um, in order to make it happen, which is, which is challenging. You know, access to general practice is a challenge for a couple of days. Access to psychology and to psychiatry is is much more than that sometimes. Um, so getting those getting those access points to, to help um, Lisa along can be can there can be delays in time, which which perpetuates the whole illness model. Um, and and the overarching with all of this is that the benefits of going to work and benefits of staying in safe, meaningful work is uh, needs to be reminded. Everybody needs to be reminded of that all the time, so that that's that's in fact the way back to work is to have safe, meaningful work provided um, in, in graduated, um, and a graduated care plan to get this person back to work and back to full function. Thanks, Stephen. Actually, a few people have been saying that Lisa sounds exhausted yeah. and that maybe she does need a bit of rest. Is that something we need to juggle against, not, I guess, encouraging an appropriate time off, but um, she's either about to blow or about to collapse? I'm just wondering if she does need some time to rest and how we judge that. Um, yeah, that's that, and that can certainly be be suggested and discussed. Whether that's as DL initially said, whether that's part of a, a a standard sick leave certificate, whether it's her taking annual leave or even long service leave as part of that break, um, or whether that's the uh, liability falls to the workers' compensation organisation, that's perhaps a little bit up for grabs. Um, and you know, having a break is fine, but you know, having a break. Uh, may not be the right thing, or may be the right thing. That's all part of the discussion. Yep. All right, great. Thanks for that. So, DL, your final thoughts about what we've discussed tonight? Absolutely, and I think we're all saying uh, similar sentiments, but I just wanted to say something about having the break. I think it's all about moderation. So it's good, you know, she can have a rest, but don't, don't rest for 10 days in bed and not leave your room. So my take-home messages are, I think we've all said them, focus on functioning, not just on symptoms, diagnosis and treatment. Avoid avoidance. Maintain meaning, purpose, activity, distraction. Keep, it, keep someone engaged while they're off work if they're off work. Work to resolve the issues from day one. Keep at work if possible. And when you're filling out that certificate of capacity, understand the benefits but also the risks. That's it. Fantastic. Thanks for that. So we're heading into the home straight now. Please don't leave us, uh, everybody. I'm going to ask you for to complete the exit survey and provide feedback. If you don't, we will play political jingles down the phone at you until you do so. So please do fill out that uh, that questionnaire when it pops up or hit the pie chart icon um, in the lower right corner of the screen uh, to get that to, um, to fill out. Uh, so thanks for participating, everybody. Um, there's a few things I wanted to mention. Uh, Comcare have on their website at comcare.gov.au uh, some information about a conference they have coming up on the 7th, 8th of June that may well cover off some of the other things that have been bobbing up tonight in the uh, discussions. Um, so please have a look at that website. The next webinar is for MHPN, again, to be, there's an Emerging Minds webinar. The next one's on the 15th of June, which is about building parents' understanding of play to nurture infant and toddler mental health. 
Um, there's also one on uh, age, frailty, loneliness and suicide in older Australians on the 29th of June and another one from NHPN on collaborative care for people living with tics and Tourette syndrome on the 6th of July. So plenty going on. And uh, judging by what's been bobbing up in the chat, I think uh, there's a big demand for uh, a webinar on dealing with difficult personalities in the workplace who might be bullies uh, contributing to the situation. So um, there's a lot of interest there. Um, I wanted just to remind people that uh, MHPN's networking program supports practitioners to meet and network with each other uh, from the local community and that there are more than 350 such networks across the country. So the MHPN website, uh, .org.au, uh, will help you find your nearest one. If you want to start one up, because uh, there's not one near you, then there's an email address there that you can contact, networks at mhpn.org.au, um, or put it in the survey when we get to uh, when you get to filling that out at the end. So thank you, DL, Suzanne, Stephen, thank you all very much, and also to the MHPN team behind the scenes that make these webinars possible. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge that the uh, lived experience of people and their carers, some of whom have been on the call tonight, I've noticed, who have lived with mental illness in the past and who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you all for the thousand odd people who have attended with us tonight. Thank you to our speakers and we wish you well. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Good night, everybody.